I'm Colin Williams. And I'm Ian Rowlands. And welcome to Beneath the Stream, a podcast about the human experience in the non-human world. Um, so Ian, what of the following works of art got in common? Um, Led Zeppelin 3, um, by Led Zeppelin. Um, uh, For Emma Forever Ago by Bon Iver. And The Dharma Bums by Jack Kerouac. Um, I have absolutely no idea. Okay. Sorry. They were all written um, in retreat. They were all written in isolation. Led Zeppelin disappeared off to um, a cottage in Snowdonia in, in North Wales to, to write and record some early demos of Led Zeppelin 3. And uh, Jack Kerouac, um, when he wrote The Dharma Bums, he wrote that while he was a fire lookout. The, yes, at the fire tower. That's yeah, right, yeah, exactly that. And, uh, and Bon Iver disappeared to a sort of cabin in the snow to write and record for Emma forever ago, which is a... A modern classic. And I think that for people who create, people who are writing, making music, um, then the idea of isolation, the idea of retreat into the wilderness um, is important. I I guess I could have mentioned many other examples. Um, And so I've been fascinated with this idea of retreat and what it does to the artistic process, how we, uh, and as those artists connect with nature what happens to them what happens to the rhythms of their day what happens to the way they write the way they create and um and so we're joined today by a rather special guest someone i interviewed um way back in the summer um it's ed o'brien from radiohead who just kindly agreed to talk to us about um the writing and recording process for his fantastic solo album earth um because he retreated to mid wales um uh, to do the writing for that record and record some of the early demos for that record. And I talked to him about what happened while he was there. Um, and and it turned out that Ed is just one of the most generous um, and, and nicest guys you could ever wish to meet. And he was, he was, he was so generous with his stories about uh, what happened while he was out there, how he, how he wrote, how he recorded and uh, the sort of rhythms that the, the, that the wilderness and nature gifted him um, as he was uh, writing um, and recording for this solo album. Yeah, I was gutted I couldn't make it. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, Ed. Sorry I couldn't be there. Um, and I can't wait to listen to it. Ed, thank you so much for joining us on Beneath the Stream. Thanks for taking the time out. It's a pleasure. Thank thank you for having me. And we really hoped that you'd appreciate a conversation, a a little bit of a different take on your writing um, process for Earth. But but first of all, congratulations on Earth. It it sounds fantastic. What a great record. You must be so pleased. Thank well, first of all, thank you. Um, yeah, I it's been a long time coming, and I think it's one of those things that when I made it, I you get it to a place where you're so happy with it. And the funny thing is, since it's been released, I now start to hear the flaws and its shortcomings for me, which I think is part of the inevitable creative process. But yeah, I mean, I got it to a place where I had to, you know, I had to own it completely, and I had to be certain because. I think if you step out of the Radiohead bubble, if you like, you have to, whatever you do, you have to, you know, you have to accept that some people are going to like what you do and other people's aren't, but you have to make sure that you love it. And when it came out, when I, when I had it mixed and we finished it, I loved it. Yeah. And, and so you, you clearly had an itch to scratch there. And, and, and so why this particular time? Why, why the solo record now? I don't know. I think it's a lot of things. I think it's timing is a lot to do with, you know, circumstances in life. I've I've been quite, um, I've spoken a lot about this, that having had it, you know, our kids are born, you know, our first child was born in 2004 and we've got two two children and, and, you know, they're now teenagers, but it was very important for me and the family and my wife that when they were young, that I was around a lot. And the thing about being in a band like Radiohead is there are times when you're not around a lot, you're away on tour, but when, when you're back, you are around a lot. And I, when those moments when I was back, I didn't want to be distracted from, 
being a father, being a husband, you know, doing... I, I was very aware that when they were little, that it was an incredibly amazing time uh, watching these little these little beings, these little souls. And, and also, I did find it also one of the most challenging times. I found it really difficult. I mean, it was really tough, but it was the most rewarding of times and the most... I think it's it was just... I think, it, you know, when children are really little, if you can be around as much as you can, it's only a good thing. They They need your attention. They need your love. They need your presence. And I didn't want to have I had enough on my plate with you know there was enough musical stuff going on with Radiohead without having to venture else you know outside of that and so it was only when they became a little bit older that suddenly I had a little bit more time and I thought oh hang on a sec there's definitely as you said an itch that I wanted to scratch. Mm. Yeah a, f- a friend of mine an artist he spends he's a wildlife artist he works all over the world he spends a lot of time abroad and and he talks about how precious those times are with his children when they're young, while they're, while they're still willing to hold his hand on, on the way to school. And, yeah. And, and small and simple things like that, it's so important. Yeah, we're, we're, we're sort of, you know, I've had a real sense of, as a parent, being a guardian. You know, you're a guardian because your job and, you know, as I, when, when, when the shit occasionally hits the fan, as it does with between parental children's relationships along the way which is all inevitable the the thing that I always say I say listen what we're trying to do here is we're trying to prepare you to be a sentient compassionate empathetic good human being and our job is to prepare you for that and I think you know I also came from a split family and I could see the how it affected me so I really felt like it was really important to be around and it's and it is it's it's it is magical and it's so it's it's a moment you know when you're in the middle of it when you're in the tunnel those early I always used to call it the tunnel which are those probably the first three years so the so our children are born two years apart so probably from 2004 until about 2007 you're in the tunnel where you're lacking sleep you know there's a reason sleep deprivation is a form of torture and you're in the tunnel and it seems like you're in it, but it's so moment it's so momentary, you know? So, um, yeah, it's been a hugely important part. It's, it's the most important thing that, you know, I, as far as I'm concerned, like when the kids are born, the biology kicked in hugely and it's like, okay, this is, this is my, this is my job for the next 20 years really is this is the primary focus. And so I wanted to, uh, I, I heard you mention in an interview that um, in, in the writing process for Earth, um, you, you took yourself away. Um, you retreated to a certain extent, and I don't know whether that was to your, to your home in Wales or, or somewhere else, but um, ca- can, you, can you take us there? What, what, what was that like? What, what could you see from your window? What, why did you feel that was important to do? Well, the first thing that I did, so I I'd sort of, the, the bit that's been kind of documented quite a bit, and I've spoken a lot about it, is, is, is going off to Brazil and having living rurally in Brazil with my young family, which we did in 2012, and we lived on a farm. And, and that, was, that was an incredible... And that kind of sowed the seeds for it. Um, and I, I've, I've spoken a lot about that, but I think one of the things that sort of has been slightly overlooked, and I haven't, but it's not as kind of, if you like, as... Um, as sexy as going to Brazil and living there with your family in a heart and living was the time spent in Wales. So when we, when we were out in Wales, uh, out in Brazil, first of all, it's, it's like, I really want to write. This is what I want to do. And I sort of was influenced by carnival and nature. But for me, it was a real return to being in the countryside. I grew up in, um, well, first 10 years of my life, my parents were together. We lived in Oxford, but then my parents separated. My mum, my sister and I moved out to West Oxfordshire, very near the Vale of the White... Well, in the Vale of the White Horse, very near Uffington White Horse Hill, on the other side of the Downs from you. And, you know, I, my love of countryside grew. It also was, you know, as a teenager, it was incredibly boring because there were only like three buses into Oxford a day. Um, but the, this... I, I, that feeling of being in 
in in countryside and 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 Oxfordshire in those days as well, West Oxfordshire, right on the cusp. It was kind of wild. It wasn't like it is now. There are a lot of derelict houses. There were no four by fours. There was no there was no money around basically. There was not the money that there is now, and so it was kind of quite. I loved it in the winter and I loved this kind of feeling of feeling the elements. And I got that again in Brazil. And I said to my wife, I said, I'm, you know, it's ironic. We, here we are in this, we're in the, we're in the wilds of Brazil. We're on the edge of the Atlantic, Macho Atlantic of the rainforest. And I'm craving wild British countryside. And I said, when we get back, I feel like I want to, I want to go out there. So literally we got back from Brazil in about, June 2013 and within a week I was in mid Wales and I'd looked at a map and I'd gone where are the remotest parts in the United Kingdom and there's the highlands and there's this part in the middle of mid Wales people know Snowdonia in the north and the Breckens and Pembrokeshire and the Gower and everything the south also but this area of mid Wales is called the Cambrians and and you were, we had one friend who lived out there, the writer Jay Griffiths, mm-hmm. and she I I'd sort of met her. I loved her book called Wild. It, yeah, it's been, fantastic. It's an amazing book, isn't it? No, it's beautiful. And beautiful. And she was the only person I knew in Mid Wales, and she said, "Come on out." And so uh, I went out, and I started. It was funny. The moment I got to Mid Wales, I was like, "I'm home," and I was just like. This is where I want to find home. So what happened was that that summer um, I was sort of coming back and, and we thought, you know what? We need to find a bolt hole. I need to find, I, I realised I needed to be back in the countryside. I realised what being, and I loved London, but I realised that 20 years in London had taken its toll on me in a kind of a spiritual, emotional, creative way. And there was something that I felt being in the countryside that that made me feel alive, truly alive, and and um, connected to the bigger picture of what it means to be on 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 living on on this planet. You know, so that summer we we all rented a cottage, family rented a cottage down in the Raider, down near Raider in the in the um, Elan Valley, and it was and. We stayed on this cottage on this farm next to this um, next to the River Wye with all these gnarly old oaks and and I was just like oh my god this is this is where I want to write this is this is it so I came back about three four weeks later so the holiday season passed the kids were back at school I had a pass out for three weeks and I rented this I rented a cottage I rented the same rooms and I started my writing process for proper. And my day began with, you know, it was, it was, it was on the edge of the, it was on the, on a hillside. So I'd walk up, I'd get up early um, and walk to the top of the hill. And it was usually shrouded in mist. And we're talking about the end of September and the, and the, the bracken and the heather are turning. And, and sometimes it cleared and you, were, you know, you had amazing vistas. And then I walked back down into the valley next to the Y and I had my copy of Walt Whitman's Leaves of Grass. And I didn't just read it to myself. I'd read about four or five pages aloud. It's a bit like there's something about the power of these words. It's like Shakespeare. There's something that happens when it's internal, it's powerful. But when you actually say these words, it's, it's incredible. It, it, and I found, I found myself, it was very much like that Whitman spirit, I could feel it, and maybe the spirit of Blake, I felt profoundly um, inspired. And I felt this kind of divine thing. This, it was a very, very, and so I'd then go up to the cottage and I'd work all day, I'd work, I'd play, I'd pick up my tools, I didn't know what I was doing, and I started, and that's where the, the seeds of the record were all, were all planted and the thing started rolling. And it was that, it was really important and, and, and you know, it was a, 
it was a very autumnal scene in mid Wales. Um, the, the browns, the reds, the greens, the golden light, sometimes rain, sometimes mist. And I realized that that is, that's, that's a lot where my inspiration comes from. Th- that's splendid, Ed. And, and to, to quote Dylan Thomas, he actually said, a, a poem not read out loud is only half a poem. Did he um, say that? He did. Yeah, he did. I mean, it's, it's so funny because you think, you think, I thought I was a bit of a madman at first. I thought, what the hell am I doing? You know, <laughs> someone comes along walking along the Y here. They're going to think they've come across some nutter. But it is, and I think it's, I, you know what's interesting as well? It also tapped into a kind of a Celticness in me as well. It was, I, you, you feel so much in Wales that you're part of this kind of Celtic, um, this ancient Celtic tradition, the Celtic spirituality, if you like. And I recognised it from some of the feelings of travelling in Ireland, going to see family in Ireland, in Southern Ireland with the kids and going over there. And, and there's something in the land and there's, some, there's a reason why Wales is such a fertile place for poets, writers, artists, musicians you know, Ireland too and Scotland. And I'm not saying, you know, London's obviously a first, but there's something about the timelessness. You feel like you're tapping into a very, very rich vein of tradition. And and also at this time when, you know, we're living in a time of heightened um experience if you like in terms of what's going on and the acceleration of time to go somewhere like that really pulls you back from the drama and roots you in what it means to be a human being and for me that was central to the to what I was trying to convey the bigger picture in in my music and and if you like the existential nature of what it means what what are we doing here what are we doing walking on this planet and I think so much of modern life if you live in a city all you see are buildings literally mm. man-made buildings you go to the center of the city of london you see the extraordinary you see the shard and what do they tell you they tell you these are these are human you we've built this look at and look at all this technology and the and there's no there's it's it's about dominion over nature and when you go out to nature that's the bit that really resonates with me that's like a a big cliff face or a waterfall or a, a brook or a you know um uh, 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 the, the sea from the top of Plin Limon. These are things that's that's true awe. That's true, and I, I think I think that you know for me it's been a reconnection with nature, is a reconnection with life because I think life in the city, everything is supremely disconnected at the moment. We've mm. sort of we're reaching. That's why we've got a crisis on our pla- on our planet because we all most of us live in cities and decision makers are made in cities. They're not made in the countryside. So they forget. We've, there's, a, there's a complete, yeah, there's a complete dis, disconnection. There's, there's a lovely quote that actually I scribbled down um, ahead of talking to you Ed, um, from the wonderful Rebecca Solnit from, from her book Wanderlust. And if you haven't read it, I, I, I highly recommend it. And she says this, many people nowadays live in a series of interiors disconnected from each other on foot and in nature everything stays connected for for while walking one occupies the spaces between those interiors in the same way one occupies those interiors one lives in the whole world rather than in interiors built up against it yeah perfect and as you say wales is a very storied landscape it has has so many has so many layers in it and um and the wonderful american writer barry lopez you use the word divine he uses the word sublime sublime yeah. encounters he talks about falling into resonance with places. And so it sounds as if as, as you spent time in there, as, you, as, as it created a new routine for you, it created a kind of architecture that, that in the morning was, was walking, it was reading aloud, um, mm. that, that it sounds as if you fell into resonance. It, and because of that, can you, can you hear the place it, in, in how, the, in how the, the album ended up and, and the songs yeah, ended up? Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. I remember when um, I remember when I was in the writing process, and it was at the end of 2013, and we bought we bought our we which is our home. We bought our home. We just moved. We just sort of were moving in, and I just demoed the track Brazil, 
and um, and it's kind of interesting because the demo isn't too far from what actually turned out. And I had to do this drive from. Uh, we arrived, you know, for Christmas with no food, and the only food that was around there was somewhere open in Aberystwyth, which is on the coast and about twenty seven miles away. And the road from where we are, it's 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 a high road, and it snakes its way through. And it was a stormy day. It was like one of those real winter storms. And they were saying, you know, you should try and, not, you know, all only only necessary journeys. And like, this is a necessary journey. So I remember I, 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 I put on, I, start, I thought I put on um, the demo in here. And, and it's about three in the afternoon. So it's dark. It's getting, it's dark already, essentially, then in, in sort of 21st of December. And the, I realised there was a there's a sound of the place, and somehow I'd managed to that spirit. I'd managed to get some of it into the music that I was making, and it is it's it's there's a there's a there's a sound to it, and there are many sounds to it because of course, you know, what I love about places like Mid Wales and these wild places are that on a stormy day they are foreboding you get in your car and you're thankful for you know you're thankful that it's warm you're kind of cocooned and you can sort of feel the storm going on about you um but then you know on a on a day like this you'd go up there and it's one of the most gentle places on earth and and the birds are, are singing so there are many songs there and like you said I think I, I'm very aware of like when you walk paths there and 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 you you really get the feeling, and I really get the feeling that down down by by particularly by the River Wye, that you feel the echoes of 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 people walking down it. You really feel it, like these old oaks that you see. I remember last night. It is it is it was sort of magical. You go down there, and you it could be it could be Wales one thousand years ago, and not not a lot would have changed. You just feel it, and. I think as, I think as musicians, I think musicians and artists. Well, it was Ezra Pound who said that artists are the the antennae of society, and I think by that, you know, there's a sensitivity there, and I think we, you know, certainly, I've always picked up on res. Even when before I was a even when I was a kid, and I think children again are very good at picking up places and resonance of places. That I, w- I always resonated with places or didn't, and, and yeah, it's like like you were saying, you fall into the resonance of the place, and you, and it's not the other thing is which interesting, it's not always easy, you know. Sometimes you feel the darkness of these places because a lot of these places, there is there are some dark chapters in there, you know. You can, it's not all oh wow this is beautiful. It's like wow that can be quite, that's scary. Those those black cliffs on a January day and it's beating down there's something quite intimidating about where I am now this the you know the 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 rain is hitting it it's it's hard it's not you know the wind is howling these aren't easy places to be but you feel very connected and alive I couldn't agree more and I think in in places like that you you definitely have a sense that those oak trees and those paths and 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 those places um, have a memory of their own for everything that's passed by mm. before you've walked there. Um, yeah. And I'm very, I'm very taken with the idea that landscape hold the ethereal things of love and grief and and the human condition as much as they do uh, the the own physical history of themselves. There's 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 things behind and underneath the landscape as well as what we see. I think. want to go back to um the sort of routine you described there a little bit yeah. um ed because um had you had you gone there intending that uh, right th- this is how i'm gonna this is how i'm gonna begin my day this is what i'm gonna do or or did the place kind of gift you that did that kind of lead you into that routine did it take a little while to find it no it i i was very much i had a real sense of what do i feel is what do i want to do rather than what what should i do 
the should thing will say, well, you should get up at seven. You should probably start working at about half past seven. And do you know, I wasn't, I was just like, and, and that's something I actually constantly, not constantly, but I'm trying to, you know, I've come up in a, when you have the sort of education that we've had in the background, it's all about, it's very about, it's high achieving. It's working hard, which is a great thing, but it's also what it, there's a problem with that because it also disconnects you with what you feel, what you want to be doing. And I was, had a real sense that I wanted to trust my intuition and be guided by my intuition because that for me is the most that for me is the unknown. You know, my head can tell me, my mind can tell me where I should be going, what I should be doing. But every time I sort of went down that that avenue, I ended up at a sort of cul-de-sac. And then I go back, well, what do I really want to do? And then, and they go, well, just pick up the guitar in the corner. Oh, but I've done that before. No, that's what I really want to do. Oh, and so the intuition is the, is going to, it's, 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 it's the, following what you want to do is is for me is the best guide because it, it's venturing into the unknown because you don't know what will happen because you're going oh that feels right that feels right so when I got down to Wales um must have arrived sort of um uh, probably about two o'clock Saturday afternoon classic kind of cottage check-in and I had a bit of gear and I set it up and had some guitars and tried to and the 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 farmer the people who rented out were really great I had to appease them that I wasn't going to make a racket and <laughs> you know I became a I think they're really lovely and got to know them quite well and I was sort of quite a curiosity at first um yeah they needed to know they hadn't rented the cottage to Ozzy Osbourne I guess yeah yeah, yeah. and then I you know I I saw uh, and, then, and you know you said so what are you a musician so well yeah I am I'm here to write well, well, have you done anything and you go oh well, yeah I'm in a I'm doing my own stuff at the moment, but I'm in a band. What's the band name? Radio. Oh, I think, I think I've heard of you guys. And it usually it's their children who like, they usually come. Like, I just mentioned it to my uh, my son, who's at Cardiff University or whatever, and he's 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 you're kidding me, sort of thing. So, um, <laughs> you know, I have to digress slightly, but that's the kind of so you get settled in, and I I think it was just again. I mean, I wake up early, I wake up, I try and wake up early and meditate. That's a really important part of the day for me. And that's a really, I've been doing that for about, oh, probably about 18, 19 years. And it's been a really, it's a key part to my, to how I live life. It's been really important and continues to be really important and will be. And then if you do that, you know, it's suddenly, oh, well, I'll have a cup of tea and then, okay. And I look out and I go, oh, I really want to walk these hills. And it's, it's, it's quite a, it's quite a misty morning. I really want to get out there. So I just go out there and I'd like, oh, well, I've, I'm reading Walt Whitman Leaves of Grass. Let's do that. And then you see other things. So the reading out aloud bit, about three days before we went, my wife and I watched, hadn't seen it for years, Dead Poets Society. And of course, Walt Whitman is, Leaves of Grass is central in that. And... So there's a bit of serendipity there. and But then that whole thing where they're reading out aloud, they're reading out the poetry in nature, in that cave. And I just thought, I just love that film. I love that film. It's just, it's such a, again, it's about people doing something from their hearts. You know, they're brought up in very privileged, but constricted uh, upper middle class American society boarding school. And then, you know, they're all supposed to be doing their right thing. And then this teacher comes along and inspires them, you know, inspires them to feel the words, to feel, feel nature, to feel life, to, you know, carpe diem, suck the marrow out of life. And, and I was just like, fuck, yeah. So I was, I had my copy of Leaves of Grass and I thought, I'll give this a go. And then you do it and you go, wow, this is powerful. And I feel alive. I feel alive in a way that I haven't felt alive for a very, very long time. You know, I, in, a, in terms of that connectedness, that, 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 and I do call it, it is funny, it's like some people, you know, resonance. For me, it's a, it, it's a very spiritual thing. Mm. And I do think my, my, you know, I come from a generation of parents who rejected, you know, Catholic, I'm, 
I was christened Catholic, but my parents rejected Catholicism quite rightly. Coming from Oxford, you know, the default, the default position is I'm an atheist. And that's how I grew up with. I'm an atheist. So at the very least, I'm an agnostic. However, my experience of life, and particularly traveling in South America, where it's a different kind of, there's a spiritual dimension to a lot of places in those countries. And I can't explain it. I could, people who go there and people who live there understand it. Um, it's very different from here. It's very different from living in, in London. But what I, I sort of awakened there and it was suddenly like, you know, I, I, there's, there's, a, there's a spiritual side of life that is very important. And actually, I think that's what, you know, as a society, if you like, one of the problems, again, the disconnection is being spiritually bereft. We are, you know, there's a, there's an, so my life has been the last 20 years, I've read a lot of Buddhist texts, I've read a, a lot of esoteric stuff, and it's trying to, Aldous Huxley, The Perennial Philosophy, which was a very important book for me, where he, Aldous Huxley, this quintessential English scholar who went to Eton and Oxford and everything, but he he's this he's pulled together all these all the all the truths at the hearts of all the all the religions so the spiritual so the sufis in islam the christian mystics the the kabbalists in uh, the jewish mystics and at the heart and buddhism it's and hinduism it's all the same they say the same thing so that for me is where and where i feel in touch with that and where it really resonates is when I'm in the country. And I feel it at times in the city and, you know, particularly when you meet people, when you meet, you know, you meet, and it's, I'm not saying that cities are bereft of this stuff, but it's a lot harder. But in the countryside, I'm much more connected to that. And that's a really, that's a really important part of my life now. And I think so, something you, you, you said um struck a chord with me there. I was, I was recently talking to uh, an ethnomusicologist who had done some work with some indigenous peoples in Mexico, talking about their music and how they, how they make music. Um, and they very much ensound the world around them. And as I was talking to her, it's a, it, so in their ceremonies and, and things like that, a lot of the music they make is echoes of birdsong, uh, echoes of wind in the trees, echoes of the sound of rain on leaves all of those things and she said it's very difficult for us to understand we have to step outside of our own detachment from the natural world where we think of ourselves as observers of of the natural world around us they see themselves very much as participants mm -hmm. they are they are another species um, it, and and they are inhabiting the animals the trees the, the landscapes around them and it is a whole the, often these things open up whole new ways of looking and seeing and I wanted to know whether that looking to another one of our senses whether those experiences for you opened up whole new ways of hearing as well not only the world around you but how that came out in your own music and how you heard your own music because of those experiences well that's a really good, that's a really interesting thing to be talking about right now, because no, not in the music that came out on Earth, my record, except, I digress slightly for a minute, when I was work when I started in Brazil and I started the process, I was very aware of, I used to go up to this, to this, this little hut house next to, next to a lake and try and write. And the sound of all the insects in the field, the polyrhythms of insects, was suddenly, I had a eureka moment. I said, like, this is samba. These are where, I mean, I don't know, I'm, I'm sure it's been said, but those, having gone to carnival and the polyrhythms of carnival, and it was suddenly like, oh my God, this is where this must have come from. It must have come from, you know, West Africa, because the rhythm part of samba is African, it's West African. This must have come from the slaves working in the fields in Africa. Also, there must be a, there's obviously also a shamanic element to that. You know, there's a rhythm and stuff. But there's a, there, like you said, there's a, there's a sort of, these are the sounds they're hearing and they're, 
part of it. And so the music that comes out, the, the rhythms that come out are polyrhythm to, because you can't escape when you're in these fields from hearing these patterns and the way that these patterns play off one another. One, one cicada will start and then another one will almost add a triplet. And then you get this, it's, it's, it's like a kaleidoscope of sound. So I was aware of that, but did I, on the record, try and, did I learn to hear differently? No. However, the whole lockdown period that we've had has, is like, has been like a watershed for me. And we were out in Wales, isolating out there, and probably like most parts of the world at that time, the bird song went, in, you know, went off the scale. It was extraordinary. And I couldn't listen to music for about 10 weeks. I got the virus and when I'm ill, I can't really listen to music. It's too distracting. And I get these terrible little, I'm sure people recognize these earworms that stay in there and they just go round and round. So I don't want to have any music. And I couldn't listen to music. There was the odd album, Laura Marling's album I listened to and loved. And I could listen to a bit of Nick Drake. But really, I didn't want to listen to music. I just wanted silence. And I think I'm now in the process of learning to hear again and listen again. And certainly all those aspects of what you're talking about, um, you know, it, th those are things that I want to incorporate in, in my, next, my next writing and my next work is, is, is that I, I, I've been hugely affected by this whole time, as I'm sure we all have. And it will have a massive effect, I think, on the music as well. Um, and so kind of to bring this full circle, um, where, where is next for you? I, I kind of wanted to ask, I mean, what, one of the great things about your whole musical career um, in Radiohead and now is, is, is never going backwards or always moving forwards. Um, and... I, it makes me wonder whether you feel as if those sorts of places, whether, whether it's the same place in Wales or the same place in Brazil or not, whether you feel that, that in future you, you'll always feel as if a, a reconnection, a retreat into those places will be, will be the right place for you to write and, and, and to be creative. Um, or do you feel that, that maybe next time around it will be a different environment, a different place that inspires you? Um. I think, you know, by, 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 by virtue of what's happening at the moment and the lack of travel, I think that Wales is, Wales and being in mid Wales is my, is my prime creative place. And in fact, I'm putting a little studio together there because, you know, that's where I feel most inspired. Um, I would love to, I mean, I would love to go and, and, and write in other places I'm I'm really drawn to there are parts of I mean South America obviously but also parts of North America there's something about the countryside and I love the southwest and there's something about the Native American lands that you go through I mean I was lucky because when I was 19 I traveled around America by Greyhound uh, in 1987 and the moment I was in the southwest in places like New Mexico and Arizona. Again, I felt, I felt alive. I felt a connection. And I, it's funny when you're, when you're on the tour bus and, and you know, you've got to drive and you'll go, I remember we were going, we were driving from Denver to, uh, I think we were traveling somewhere in Arizona. It was probably, it was probably um, Phoenix. And you, you know, you wake up at five in the morning like you can tell it's light you've been driving all night and I couldn't sleep so I go down to the front of the bus and you're driving through New Mexico and you're just seeing the this this red this red stone this red rock and this these big skies so there are parts of this world that you know feel really I would love to I would love to 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 connect with places and, and see what comes out so yeah I mean Wales is Wales is like my my base is my home, but I would love to go out and be inspired by 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 visiting by visiting these extraordinary places on our planet, which which often we were very lucky about. Traveling has always been a really 
as uh, I've been lucky because my parents, when we were younger, we travelled. We had friends who lived in India, so age eight, we went to we went to North India and stayed there with our friends in Delhi for three weeks and and travelled in the Rajasthani desert. And at that young age, you know, not many people went to India. Kind of none of my friends had been, but. Again, I, I I felt a connection with this place. I felt a connection, and and so, you know, it's it's a balance because obviously, travel and 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 travel is, is is not doesn't seem to be less of a responsible thing to do nowadays, which is, you know, which is the thing that I have to appreciate. But we were lucky, for instance, four years ago, um, it took me, me and the kids and my wife. We went to Bhutan. We like going to these places of extreme nature and beauty, and Bhutan's one of those places. And so, yeah, you feel something. You feel inspired. You feel like, you know, like people say, you know, they buy a guitar. They say there's music in this guitar, and that's so true and stuff like that. But there's music in these places. I really feel that you respond to it. So, I would love to do that. I'd really love to responsibly travel into these places and and see what happens. Well, and if I can, it's been a day of quotes, but if I can quote you, actually, Ed, and you said, you said in an interview that the music is a very visual thing for you. There's a location for it, is what you said. Yeah. And, and we recently spoke to a um, fantastic woman from northern um, Sweden who, and uh, she talked to us about um, the Sami people who she'd lived with for many, was married to a Sami man, and she talked about their songs called Yoiks which uh, are not songs that they believe we make. Uh, they believe that yoiks are gifted to them by the place. Mm. Um, and sometimes they don't have words. They're just sounds or they're just, they're, they're just musings. Um, but they, are, they believe the music is in the landscape and that, and that it, takes a, it takes a certain amount of respect and resonance, as we've spoken about, for us to hear that music. Yeah. Um, but but that music is of a particular time uh, uh, and a particular place, and it and it and it sounds so much as if Earth as a as a record um, is w- will be a record for you of a, a time and a place and a feeling and a resonance. Yeah, that, yeah, that's absolutely right. It will. It, it's I, I sort of haven't thought about it in the, those terms, but yes, it is. It's very much you know not that I'll ever really want to. You know, you never want to really play your music again. But should I hear stuff, it'll very much root me to a particular time and a particular emotion and young family and having an adventure in Brazil and then combining that with this kind of discovery of of of, of mid Wales and and these Celtic hills. So yeah, it's it's interesting when you say that because you know that. I had a real sense of, and I've heard this, this is said a lot by, you know, Aretha Franklin will say, you know, these songs, I didn't do this. This comes through me, you know, and she, she said, God, it's God. And, and, and I had a real sense of, um, on this music that these songs were already written and very much like the Sami is saying that you almost like the right, the best songs are the ones that you don't feel like you've really forced anything. You've, it's come mm. through you. You've, you've discovered it. The worst songs I find are the ones where you force it. You go, oh, you do. And, and actually, the moment I, I you know, I'm, 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 I'm also in the early stages of songwriting, but the moment I've, dis- I've found that I go, right, this is how it's going to be. And, and this is... It, or, or again, that's where the intuition comes. Your intuition is actually you tuning in. It's not you. It's not the mind. It's not the ego. It's like you tuning into whatever the frequency, the resonance, where the music comes through. So I think there is a there is a sense of you just these songs coming from there in the land. And you know, I also think that it's not a million miles away from from quantum physics. You know, past, present, and future may well be all happening at the same time and it's mm. just that on our planet we we because of our small minds and the way we compute it we have to do have a sort of form of linear time past present but actually it's all happened so one of the things i used to because i love modern science i'm not like you know i love where modern science and quantum physics is meeting buddhism if you like mm. um but that 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 that, that these songs are already written 
these songs are already written. They were written, you know, they're, they're out there and all, and your job is just to, is to find the right channel and freak, you know, channel in on it. So I'm, I had, a, I have a real sense of that. And I think that's really true. And then, you know, and you hear these brilliant stories of Paul McCartney and how, um, yesterday and he dreamt it and he thought, I, you know, that's, this isn't me. This is, this is someone else's written, but that's, that's a recurring theme in, in, in music and people who do music and, and I'm sort of, you know, who do write music, but also it's not writing music. It's, it's, um, it's allowing the music to come through, allowing it to pour out. You're a kind of a conduit, you're a vessel. Ed, thank you so much for taking the time out to talk to oh. us. We so appreciate it. And, uh, and uh, given that I've got the chance to say this now, we would say that uh, one, uh, Earth is fantastic and we recommend all our listeners hear it and love it the same way that we have. Um, but also the, the music that you and your colleagues have created over the years are, are, are hugely important to us and, and big personal landmarks for us and, and we feel that greatly. So thank you so much, um, Ed O'Brien. Oh, thank you. Thank you for your kind words and lovely questions. This has been an absolute joy. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening to Beneath the Stream. Uh, we really appreciate uh, hearing from you, but most of all, we'd really appreciate if you left us a review. Leave those nice five-star reviews of Beneath the Stream at iTunes or Google Podcasts or Spotify or wherever you listen to your podcasts and uh, give us your feedback. Thanks so much for listening. Thank you.